Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Night of the Comet panel featuring Catherine Mary Stewart and Kelly Maroney, the two lovely actresses who portrayed the sisters in Night of the Comet. I'm sure you're all very familiar with them. And joining me to talk with these amazing actors is Conrad and Dan from Movie Oubliette. Um, welcome, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about this amazing film that I personally have loved since childhood. So Conrad, please kick us off. Well, just to say, it's really great to see both of you and uh, to chat with you again. Um, yeah. Night of the Comet, of course, is a post-apocalyptic uh, thriller, also a comedy of sorts. Um, and I wondered, um, some of the the imagery that i think stays with people a lot is the sort of empty city imagery that it, that it has that you know with the red filters and so on and i was wondering you know it was striking when we first saw it in the 80s i was wondering with both of you how you feel it it plays now post covid because we've all seen empty cities like that i was wondering what your ex what your, your thoughts on that would be how many emails do you get, Kathy? Er, Catherine, excuse me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you, you can call me Kathy. I, <laughs> um, every time, every time the sky turns red, which is you know that's a weird thing to be saying at all. Every time the sky turns red, um, I, we get all these. It looks like night of the comet. It looks like night of the comet. They send me pictures and stuff, and but it does, especially when we were in quarantine. Yeah, yeah, quarantine and when there were those huge fires in LA and, and literally the sky was red at, at certain places and, and at, in other places where there's like big fires around, like I I'm from Canada and like right now, for instance, in British Columbia, there's just hundreds of fires going on. Um, and also, uh, yeah. And then that's, that sort of, you know, addresses the sky, but um, like the empty streets, certainly when COVID started up and streets were empty, people were like, you know, social media, emails, whatever, just saying, look, it's Night of the Comet. It's like, yeah, it's really bizarre. Or, and also, you know, if there's like some sort of news about a comet coming close to <laughs> right. the earth, it's like, right. it's a comet. Right. Then we get you all know, these, but can I be in your lawn, lawn storage shed with you? Or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's so, it's, who, who would have, thought that you know people would identify with nothing common at all all these different weird levels it's it's and it's amazing yeah 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 how how did you film those scenes because this was a, a pretty low budget movie as far as i could tell so it's not like you could lock off mm -hmm. whole blocks to to <laughs> film it was there any special trickery involved mm -hmm. or is it just quiet mm -hmm. in la on a sunday morning <laughs> It's bizarrely easy to find a deserted part of town in Los Angeles, even to this day. But there, are, we just had to shoot at weird times. Yeah, nobody there. Was, we shot. Was it Christmas? We shot at weird times, but also it was around Christmas. But also back in the eighties. I mean, downtown LA was, you know, banks and a few yeah. hotels, and people would fly into that area to have like business meetings or something. Mm -hmm. But but basically, except for sort of a skid row kind of area, um, it was deserted, you know, and especially around that time. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, they're like, they're building these high rise apartment buildings and people, you know, it's a cool place to live now. But back then, nobody really lived down there, did they, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Especially where we were shooting. No, it was, not at all. and, and and also the time, definitely, it was like, you know, around Christmas, early in the morning, and yeah, nobody was uh, blocking off streets. We weren't, we didn't have the, the um, budget to hire a police force to like hold traffic back <laughs> at all. No, our police force so, was on the top. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was on break. Yeah, yeah. And he was just Thank in a you. dream. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's it's really when you look back, I mean, when I look at that, I think you'll never be able to do that again, unless you're like Tom Cruise or somebody like that who does have billions of dollars to spend. It, 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 we, we hit a real sweet spot in terms of being able to do that kind of thing in a place like Los Angeles, a downtown area like Los Angeles. Yeah. 
So when you're filming something like that, that is an effect that's completely in the camera, and of course, you're not really able to respond to that, and you're not seeing it, with the first time you see the film, and I'm not sure how each of you initially saw the final film, does it sort of surprise you? Or does it how, how does that, you know, you're, you're kind of like, wow, that's not at all how I thought this was going to look? Or, or how does that work for you? Um, I, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I think that they, you, they set Reg up really well to have seen it by the time she gets home. And I see it only when I open the door. Right, right. Um, yeah. right. Happen, as far as I'm concerned then, but didn't they kind of set that up for you, Catherine? Oh, for sure. I mean, it was empty. It looked like it did. The only thing yeah. that wasn't as uh, realistic, I suppose, was, uh, or, or I mean, in the moment was like the red sky, but right. um, I, they, they showed how they were doing it. So I, oh, I okay. had a sense of what it was going to look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally just a filter on the, the lens that yeah. lens yeah. kind of graduated to red, mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty. I mean, that's kind of giving away a secret because ooh, big special effect. But <laughs> yeah, well, and but, smoke, I mean, you smoke too, which we found out later was toxic, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when I come out of the theater and I see all the dust everywhere, that was like brick dust or something like that. So I had a sense of that, and uh, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, it wasn't a massive surprise. Yeah, we sort of had a sense of what was going on. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I sort of I'm just imagining that, you know, you're filming in empty streets. And so for from your perspective, it may look one way, but to us, it looks epically, you know, empty, and mm. it's got the red filter on it. And so it's sort of like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, yeah. that looks so much more, you know, in the camera, mm. it looks so much different than of course, it probably did huge, for the two of you. Yeah, huge wide shots. And just the way they shot it as well, really created that that sense of you know, yeah. absolute abandonment, you know, it was interesting. Right. I really had a sense, because I didn't live here at the time of, it was easy for me to go that um, that these people were the only ones left because we were shooting all the time and I didn't know anybody here. I didn't have, certainly didn't have family or anything here. So it was really, that was very organic. You know, you're all I got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, so I I was on Conrad and Dan's podcast uh, a couple of months ago, maybe, and we talked about this movie. And you know, I did a lot of sort of rewatching it. And I was an army brat growing up, and so mm -hmm. for me, you know, both of your characters in the film are army brats or military brats, anyway. And you sort of have this very. Um, it's not even like a. It's sort of just. I have to take care of myself. I'm going to take care of it myself because, it, and it really rang true to me as an army brat because you really have to do that. You always have to kind of be preparing for one of your parents to potentially be shipped off somewhere, go to war, maybe not make it back. You learn to be extremely self-sufficient. And so your characters really seemed very true to life. and. I lived on a military base in Alaska, actually, when I saw this movie back in the wow. 80s. And all of my friends, uh, who I still keep in touch with now uh, on Facebook, and I talk about this movie, and they're like, I loved this movie. It really, really rang true to me. And I feel like maybe that's somewhat even more so with uh, those of us who are sort of army brats. Have you ever heard that or thought about that as an aspect of your character's uh, development? Um, well, in terms of being an army brat and, you know, absolutely there was a sense that we were self-sufficient because we did have a step mom, so, theoretically, <laughs> but she, she wasn't interested in like taking care of us at all. So right. we were very, you know, just sort of, um, foundationally independent. Yeah. And also, you know, dad taught us how to shoot Mac 10s and he taught us that sort of independence as well. But it's funny because I am not an army brat at all. Well, I'm also from Canada, so we don't have much of an army <laughs> to be a brat about. <laughs> we have like, I know. Um, although I did do, we did, um, actually when I was a kid, we traveled a lot. 
so strangely, and I know a lot of army brats do that. And so they, you know, when they pick up, they move and they have to re uh, reestablish themselves. And as a kid, I actually did a surprising amount of that with my um, science scientific father so maybe uh, mm. nobody i i don't recall um like hearing a question from that sort of aspect from, from that perspective mm. and maybe that's um uh, i kind of that came out of me from the character for the character as well you know that sense of right. you know what you were talking about really being able to look after myself and i had my two older brothers but you know reestablishing myself wherever i was yeah, it's, mm -hmm. that's very interesting, and that, and I'm glad that came across too. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. There's a stoicism about the two girls that I think that kids who know that they got to pre be prepared for that, um, they acquire that stoicism. Like, yeah, so what? I know, you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. just even just having a dad who's going to teach you how to, to shoot a, an Uzi, maybe not an Uzi, but my dad definitely did teach me at a very young age how to handle a gun and all wow. of that. So all of that is, is actually really true. Mm -hmm. So I was like, people talk mm -hmm. a lot about the movie being funny and it is funny, but so much of it is like mm -hmm. you develop this very, you know, sarcastic sense of humor and certain mannerisms that your characters both mm -hmm. had and really nailed. And it's so much a part of being in that, that lifestyle of, of sort of moving around and having to act tough and you just kind of become tough. Uh, you both just really, really nailed that. So whether intentional or not, excellent no, job. Thank you. That. Yeah. That, that means a lot, actually. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it that's really great it to hear. a lot. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm going to jump in. I don't, want, I don't want to hear things like, well, you know, I'm a real doctor and that was not right. <laughs> you never want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> that made absolutely no sense at all what you just did. <laughs> you've never done that. You should have asked. <laughs> so thank you for telling us. We, yeah. I'm, I'm glad. It, yeah, felt, yeah. it felt like it was the right. Yeah. I didn't feel absolutely. like I was doing anything um, that felt funny or anything. Right. Yeah, and it was kind of a great balance because Ke uh, Kelly's character uh, is so different from my character in a way, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, that's like the cheerleader and I'm sort of the, you know, I don't know what. But um, but that was mm -hmm. sort of our common common place that we could look mm -hmm. after ourselves. Yeah. 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 And also, I think for, for my character, Samantha, I know from people, uh, I'm a, I'm an only child and my, my brothers and sisters were growing up and they had kids in my category. But I do know that um, when the older person, when the older kid separates and starts not spending time with their kid, sister or brother or anything, that's a real abandonment and they have a real, a real issue with being left. And so part of the mm. thing about the comet is there she is, you know, I don't know how much how interested she is in hanging out with me, but she's all I got, and I'm really yeah. a little bit pissed that she hasn't been been around. So, in the first yeah. place, so, yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah. We have a, a super chat uh, that says it's from Jason. He says, "For Iconicon's Daddy Uzi Fund, hopefully back then they gave the wonderful <laughs> guest earplugs for those scenes. Did you did you have uh, ear protection for those scenes, or were the guns loud? <laughs> Sometimes they were rubber." Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Pretend. But I mean, like in the, uh, but in the um, mall, for instance, yeah, they were real with the blanks for sure. Um, and shooting the car, you know, when we were shooting at the car. Um, well, I mean, when we were shooting them, I'm not sure if they were always the real thing. But I think that if we wore earplugs, we probably, you probably would have seen them, you know? Yeah, maybe. So yeah. I don't, yeah, I, th I think. Maybe when we were practicing, because we were, they trained us to shoot them. Mm -hmm. And so maybe at that point, we uh, we were wearing earplugs, but I don't think sure. when we were actually shooting them. I don't, no, I don't believe so either. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, we, we do have the clip uh, from the movie that I want to play really quickly. <laughs> Everyone loves this clip. So uh, I just thought I'd share it because people absolutely love it, including me. So here we go. It's a really mm -hmm. short clip. See, this is the problem with these things. Daddy would have gotten us Uzis. 
the car. I didn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I love Everybody it. loves that scene, and that was improvised. I know. That's what makes it even better. Oh, no. <laughs> I think audiences can tell when, some, when something it just jumps out at you and something actually just happened spontaneous or was 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 not part of the plan. You know, I, I think you it can wasn't tell in the script at all. Yeah. No. No, and you can you can you can sort of it brings you into the movie more because you feel like you're part of something. It's just a, it's a I think that's why it's memorable and also it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's very funny. It's very because funny those and stupid, it, yeah, those Mac tens they jam all the time. So it was just right. like how are we supposed? <laughs> kept trying to shoot the scene and shoot the car, and this thing mm -hmm. kept jamming, and it was finally like. <laughs> You know, Daddy would have got us Uzis, and I'm mm. like, well, like I didn't know you were home. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just, I just yeah. love the idea of someone like Catherine just sitting around going, you know, those Mac Tens, they just jam all the time. Like Basically, everyone knows that. Designed for housewives. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. The Mac Ten submachine gun is practically designed for housewives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Which thing was too probably is probably also added. Don't you think maybe that was added to the script because I think they were supposed to be Uzis, weren't they? Yeah. And okay. and um, yeah, they they, we did, they cheaped out and they didn't want to get Uzis, so they got us the Mach Ten. And Tom was furious. He and he said these are going to do nothing but jam. I'm gonna, not going to be on time. It's going to cost us money. And he was furious. And so he was probably waiting for the time. <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you know it, it was a running thing. He never, never stopped being mad about it. You know, <laughs> irritated about it. So I think when that that start, he says it's going to jam. And when it does, I said, I know. I'm sorry. And he goes, when it does, I want mm. you to say something. And I thought, no, I'm going to get in trouble. He goes, all right, give it, you're going to say, see, here's the problem with these things. Daddy would have gotten Uzis, as in Tom would have gotten us Uzis. Right. <laughs> because you know the photo of the family, Tom Eberhard, the director writer, is the in the photo is the father. Yeah. Really? So, wow. Yeah. So I mean, he was literally saying, Daddy would have got us Uzis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the producers are too cheap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Dan, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say. I mean, one of the, my favorite parts of the movie is the dynamic between you two as as sisters. It, it it's so authentic. Like, was it instant connection when you met in real life as as actors? We didn't audition together at all. And so the first time we met was when we did that those family portraits. They said. Come on down, but you're supposed to be young, it's supposed to be like a younger picture, so don't wear any makeup, don't do your hair, blah blah blah. And that's the first time I think I saw CMS here. I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we auditioned with different people that were mm -hmm. physically, I guess, well, especially facially, or uh, you know, mm -hmm. you auditioned with somebody who was blonde. I auditioned with somebody who was had darker hair mm -hmm. and darker eyebrows and all that stuff. So when I was told that I got the role. I figured it was with this other actor. And so when we went down to do the photo session, it was like, oh, goodness. And we did the photo session together. Mm -hmm. And the first scene that we did together, first day, first mm -hmm. setup, everything was in the house when I come mm -hmm. home and I'm looking for him, for her, excuse me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you hardly look like a him. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of test <clears throat> <laughs> um, and it just, I mean, actually, Kelly, you've told this story before about how, um, yeah. the, you know, they, the producers were sort of, well, we'll do the first day and chances are we'll have to reshoot mm -hmm. everything, but it'll just get us into the groove. But they were so happy with what we'd done. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah, on the first day. So, yeah, I guess we sort of naturally had some sort of it was, yeah, it was chemistry. <laughs> We didn't do any like deep work or anything, you know. I mean, we didn't prepare and do backstory, and it just—I always say it's like probably a past life thing because it, we just we just went to work, and and I thought, well, maybe it's because we both did soaps, or maybe it's because I'm from Minnesota and you're from Canada, and we have the same type of. <laughs> There's no real good answer for that, other than it's a past life thing. <laughs> I think that works. It's yeah, true. I, I, I mean, told, I. I that, that, oh, I was told by 
um, when the producer, he said, you know, uh, we were going to reshoot the whole thing. He said, you know how it's going around? He went around at the end of the day and said, no reshoots. And everyone went, yay. And I didn't know what was going on, you know. And he said, that's because when working with young actors, we assume that the first day that it's going to be a waste. And now we have to figure out, we have this house for two days. We got to figure out, you know, Gordon Booz, our AD was going, what are we going to shoot now, tomorrow? So it was, yeah, it was cool. And not only that, but so it, wasn't, it wasn't just that we didn't screw it up. It was that we already started to have fun. You know, I mean, it, that just happened right away. So mm -hmm. I just got myself super lucky. I don't know why that happened actually, but I'm really glad it did. Do yeah, you, I mean, we just that, we hit it off. Do you think that your uh, background in soaps, both of you, but particularly mm -hmm. uh, you, Kelly, in the scene where you get you have to be slapped. I heard in that you sort of talked about how the the actress who was supposed to slap you was sort of holding back and you were just like, look, we're gonna be here all day if we do that. Just yeah. just hit me, just really nail me. And uh, and then it yep. sold it. So is that is that well, accurate? Not only that, but Sharon does that thing where she grabs me by the sweatshirt. That really sells it. <laughs> 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 yes, I've, I, had the, I was playing this Lolita and we had a um, Mildred Pierce thing going on with my mother and and we had see a scene at least one where we hit each other and it didn't look real and it was like so late at night and we were so exhausted because you used to do like six shows in one day like your segment you never knew but um um so we were both tired and um i just finally said to louise because you can by trying to fake it you can actually hurt yourself trying to yeah. fake. It. i said just hit me just give me a good one and we can get out of here i can take it <laughs> And so she did. I was, I was fine. I was fine. And so she said, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Please don't hurt me. I said, listen, here's what, uh, just hit me, okay? Because it's not going to look real. And we're going to be here all night and someone's going to get hurt. So just do it. We actually, we actually have the clip. Let's watch Kelly get slapped. She does it so well. <laughs> Such a great scene. <laughs> you were born with a Doris. You don't need Chuck. <laughs> now those slaps uh were that that's that's um sound effects. Yeah. yeah that's probably we didn't they didn't make that loud of the sound but as long as we connected <laughs> yeah sure the connection was real and then the sound really sold it with those slap sounds <laughs> <laughs> and the punch that yeah and then the also the, the way you roll you know i mean i wanted it to be hard hard enough so that um i could it would be believable that I was going to roll to the couch because Tom goes, I want you to like roll and end up by the TV set because he's going to say Newfoundland or Newfoundland. And I went, <laughs> okay, well, in order for that to happen, she's got to hit me hard enough so that it's semi-believable that I go rolling over the couch. Right. It, it did have to, we did have to sell it, you know, but, but the point mm -hmm. is the point of contact was actually real. We didn't miss each other. You know? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That feels very, feels very real. And yeah. was fun for me to, to do that little stunt too. So, yeah, <laughs> that <laughs> scene is actually that scene is actually a really great example of the unique blend of comedy and and drama and horror and sci-fi and action that this movie is. And it's the the tone in it is is a really fine balance because in that one scene, you delivered a really funny line which we had to censor, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and the the first yeah. slap and the second slap they're funny, but the punch is quite shocking and then you hit the deck by the tv and the guy on the tv says looks like a great bunch of people and you think <laughs> how ironic and it's and it's sort of so it's it's gritty but it's also sardonically funny and i'm not sure whether that was something that you were actively aware of when you were working on it and and how difficult it was to achieve that balance well i, well, I, I feel like that's more of like the director's he I'm sure he ha totally understood that we you you know when you're playing something like that you have to play the reality of it and mm -hmm. not think about okay am I sardonic enough or whatever you know okay. that's that's the director's job to set it up that but of course this is your scene Kelly <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. Maybe you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, one thing that uh, has been told to me is that people, you know, during 
family dysfunction was very common. It was not unusual. Now, today, if you hit your kid, you could go to jail or something. Back then, oh, it's so white. You know, my dad hit me. My mom hit me. It wasn't that big of a deal. And other that people have told me in turn that that feels very realistic to them. Yeah. About their upbringing. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you got walloped. And, um, and it happened. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it's just... The, just achieving the balance of the comedy and the, oh, the realism. It was as Catherine said. It's you gotta you, you gotta play the reality of it. If the kiss of you can never try to be funny because you are not going to be funny. Just like you can't try to cry, you're not going to cry, and it's going to look like that. I mean, um, so that's that's there's that. And also, one producer thought we were doing a comedy, and the other producer thought we were doing a serious zombie film. And Tom was just like. You know, Tom. <laughs> That's funny. Um, this makes me mad. And you know, he's like very, with, you know, with grunt, um, gruff and like the way he is. So sometimes somebody would say, "Why are you guys goofing around? This is serious." And then we'd shoot one that was more pulled back. You know, okay. and then um, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, Tom didn't because it was film. It wasn't. It that wasn't. Um, you know, phone yet. It wasn't like this kind of. <laughs> was, um, so I think that the one that was best was the one that got printed. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 I have a few super chats that I'm just going to read really quickly. One is from Gary who says, what an amazing panel. I love this. So oh, thank you, Gary. Cool. Thank you. Tim says, I had a huge crush on Kelly and Catherine. We are fortunate to have such lovely ladies with us today. This, of course, includes Melinda. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, he's smooth, that Tim. That is yes. nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, nice Scuba, one, Tim. <laughs> Scuba Pete says, worked as an usher in high school and always thought of Comet when I had to close super late. Oh. Thank you, Kelly and Catherine, for being here. Thanks for having yeah. us. Sure. Yeah, were you hit with docs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it hurts. Jim says, uh, do y'all think Night of the Comet could have been a post-apocalyptic soap opera? I loved the mm. film. Boy, that would have been something, wouldn't it? <laughs> wow. Post-apocalyptic, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah you know. We have a limited cast, but I suppose we could run into other people. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, you, they ran into DMK after all. It's true. True. That's true. Uh, well, it's not uh, really post-apocalyptic, but I mean, we all know, I'm sure that this is pretty well known that this movie, among others, but definitely this movie inspired Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I feel like several, Kelly, of your roles kind of go in that direction. Um, I mean, you you mm. were in a Chopping Mall as sort of a, a badass, and you were in, um, oh, I just watched all these movies, and so they're all, the it's names are running together, but I can <laughs> visualize which one, oh, the, uh, the Zero Boys mm -hmm. um, was such an interesting, uh, it's kind, you kind of have, it's not the same character, yeah. but she's got that same self-sufficient thing that I feel like Buffy is also tapping into, where you've got this, um, beautiful blonde uh, character that you wouldn't expect to be this amazing badass, <laughs> and then you're just mm -hmm. like, yeah, well, let's just take care of business. So, mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel like that was? How do you how do you view things that sort of came after what you did? Like, do you kind of feel like it came from your roles, or do you think that it, there's a longer history from before your time? Um, you mean in other films? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's always been this character. I mean, I know that there was a final girl situation. It's something about Pauline. It's not the perils of Pauline, but there's something like that that was way back in the silence where, and I, I, I guess it was a comedy where no matter what happened, she always survived. <laughs> um, so that's been going on for a long time. Nobody invented the final girl. You know, right. it's, it's always been there. Um, we just didn't name it. And the first time I heard that, I was like, what's that? <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we find we find ways to, to talk about what what we're into. So, um, um, you know, when I was on the soap, the reason they cast me was because you didn't think I was going to be such a horrible human being. <laughs> you didn't. So, You're fun to watch, though, in the soaps. <laughs> 
uh, horrible. Mm. <laughs> so I think it's kind of like with me, it's kind of like uh, what you don't expect coming. Right. But uh, also, I guess I am, you know, you don't, you're never playing anybody except for who you are under those circumstances. So, I mean, you dig into yourself and you go, if this happened to me, if it, you know, I mean, because who am I going to play? You know, um, as uh, I think Spencer Tracy said, who would you like me to play? Because there I said, you're always playing yourself. I think, who would you like me to play? Yeah. Um, right. right, right, right. So you dig in and you find those elements of yourself so that you can, you know, so that you can be in that in that moment and stuff and that's what you would do so i think i think that there's a lot of times people talk about actors today with their branding and their essence and all that stuff and i think other people pick up on what it is before you do because we don't see ourselves the way other people see us and i think uh i probably was there was something about something about me that was that you know i mean i was here all by myself didn't know anybody so yeah <laughs> maybe that was it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like I just, I always, um, that, that you find that, um, that archetype thing. And if you play to the archetype thing, it works. And if you try to play against it, like in the nineties, people kept trying to cast me as a victim and right. it didn't work. And I didn't want to do it. It felt wrong. And cause nineties were heavy on the victims, you know, and I just, I hated it. I didn't like playing it, you know, and, and, um, it just wasn't me. So, mm -hmm. um, it's an archetype thing. Like we all, every human being has their hero story, their hero's journey and their archetype. And I think that that has something to do with mine. You know, we're always gonna be okay. We're gonna work our way out of this. There's nothing to get emotional about, <laughs> except for when you can't help it, but we're, you know, we're gonna do it. And I think that people are, they hope that if something like that happened, that they would be able to survive. They hope, yeah. you know, that, that's what you wish is like, you know, I can, I can do it. And so that's good to see demonstrated on film. It's like, you can do it. If you have to do it, you can do it. Uh, Timothy Ward says, do your friends and family have an understanding of how iconic your roles have become to countless people around the world? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't have a lot of family, but um, the ones that do, I, I think I have some idea, yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got, I mean, your husband is your biggest fan. It's so cute. You see the things yeah. he posts about Kelly, it's just like, he's like in awe of her. And my, uh, I mean, my husband is very, you know, no, respectful he, and he's not, he's a lovely guy and all that. Is just, he's it, adorable. He's just not online. <laughs> <laughs> he's not on this. That's true. That's true. Otherwise. He's not online. And no, he's very proud. He's very proud mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, I have two kids as well. And I think this is the classic story. They're just like, whatever. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> they, they couldn't care less. Like, they just think it's kind of silly, probably. But, you know, um, although, however, I, uh, I did when they were really young, they had these uh, birthday parties at my, my daughter was, uh, they're born like two days apart, mm -hmm. three, three years apart. But two, days, <laughs> two days. Yeah. I was wondering how was you really, managed that. <laughs> you know, super woman here. We had a birthday <laughs> um, but they had these birthday parties that I don't know, Hannah was maybe eight or not eight or something. And Con so Connor was like five or whatever. Anyway, they had sleepover par a sleepover party and both of them, screened um, Night of the Comet and The Last Starfighter. But I think they're now like, H Hannah is going to be 29 and Connor is going to be. No. Uh, well, yes. Who's the time? Oh, Connor's going to be, tw I know. Or 28 maybe. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can do <read> this. Because <laughs> their birthdays are coming up. This is uh, mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No. They're not watching, thank goodness. And <laughs> if, so it's like 20 years later. I, I I would be surprised if they've, you know, seen anything that I've done since then. Almost every once in a while, my husband will say, you guys have got to watch this. And he'll like make them look at something that I've done. I did an episode of, of some TV show and made Hannah at least look at it. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, this, is, this is cruel. This is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Catherine, mm. thinking about Reggie, thinking about what Kelly just said about finding something in her that was that was in the role. Did did you mm. find something in yourself that really tallied with Reggie? Because the fascinating thing with her is she has so many characteristics that are usually associated with male characters mm. in movies, mm. yeah. like her competitiveness over the video game, mm -hmm. her self-sufficiency. And also she doesn't seem to be particularly hung up over the guy that she's sleeping with yeah. in the in the <laughs> cinema. It's just like he dies and it's like, you know, it's sad, but she's, she's like, it's like ew, broken ew. up about oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. He was like more disgusting than anything. He's like a friend with uh, benefits when they're before we had that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's funny because up to that point, I played a lot of sort of girl next doors, girls next door. Yeah. Girls next door. And um, I think just because physically I sort of look the role to play that. But when I was uh, given this role, I felt like I, I connected more with it. I related more to the character. I've always been kind of a tomboyish sort of a character, um, pretty physical. I have two older brothers, so that probably um, contributed to the competitiveness. Uh, you know, Kelly was talking about being an only child, except with the, your older siblings. I was like an only child because the boys didn't want to have anything to do with me. I was a girl. So I had to be sort of extra, you know, aggressive and tough with them. Um, yes, but but in terms of the character, I was so happy to be able to play this thing because I felt like it was very organic for me. I mean, I absolutely concur with what Kelly says. Every character that you play it has to be a part of you in some way it has to be you you have to it's got to be organically you or the or the audience will go yeah i don't buy that yeah. but that's what made this so much fun i mean like oh, my favorite scenes were things like the fighting the zomb zombie in the alley you know i got to do that and oh my gosh that was so much fun and even riding although i didn't actually ride the motorcycle but just being on the back of it and pretending to, it was, it was, it was, it was really fun. I really, I felt definitely in touch with that part of myself mm -hmm. in this movie for sure. This is the first time I've ever realized it, but I never questioned that about that character. It really, mm -hmm. I really, I never, now that I'm thinking about it as an audience person, I never questioned it. I mean, you know, we both had boys' names. I mean, you say something about you gave us boys' names. Mm hmm Yeah. 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 Uh, Samantha and Regina that, yeah, Sam and Reg. Absolutely. Because we're tough broads, baby. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> and nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Uh, but you speak the truth for sure. I mean, it's a matter of survival in this business. I'll tell you that much. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um i'm not sure conrad you sent you sent me a message uh we do have a clip of Catherine uh fighting in the alley oh, and uh, i do love to see that uh so let's check that out really quickly <laughs> <laughs> that just looks fun it just looks like so much it, fun it was super fun and just so you know that the the zombie was a stunt guy so i you know i knew that i couldn't hurt him at all and i knew that he wouldn't hurt me so mm. you could just kind of go for it you know he picked me up literally <laughs> and I was in the air and thrown into all these boxes um but it was set up so that i wouldn't get hurt but it it, it, but that gave you the, you know, enabled you to really just go for it. So it was fun. It really sets you up, too. I mean, as if anything else hasn't, but that's really... I read that scene and I thought, I want to read for Regina. That's such a cool scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, was a, he was an actor himself, so he said, I'm going to give you one shot to read that part, but you're Samantha. I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I did. It. Yeah. That was... A th All right, I get it, but you're Samantha. <laughs> you know I am. So, but that that scene is just even on paper, and then when it came to life, it's just like the most bitching scene ever. <laughs> like, I know, yeah. I know. So much fun, and then running to the uh, motorcycle, and he's 
following me and I'm like, oh shit. And I, oops, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if I can say that, um, <laughs> okay. you know, and smashing, smashing them. And it was really, it was super fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was, well, so was there any like really, really challenging scenes in the movie to do? <sighs> um, um, physical stuff or, or what? Yeah, yeah, physical or just like uh, emotional or just acting wise. Well, for me, I, I would say the most challenging one for me was in the radio station where we have to deal with this new person mm -hmm. and we don't know where they're coming from. And then it just the, for me, that was hit every emotion you could possibly hit sort of fear and protect, protecting you and then realizing what happened to the boyfriend and, um, you know, realizing uh, what was really, really going on. And then we hear a voice on the radio and it just, you know what I'm saying? You, uh, to mm -hmm. me, that, that whole series of scenes really played the gambit of emotion and you know, even like sort of an establishing kind of a romantic thing with, uh, with, um, uh, um, oh gosh, what's, what was this? Hector. Hector. Robert Hector. Beltran. Uh, Hector. Right, right, exactly. I was gonna, I wanted to say Hector. You know, <laughs> those are very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert Beltran. I mean, those yes. are kind of delicate, they're delicate scenes to like really to me for me anyway to really pull off you know that people mm -hmm. buy that you're like you know i don't know the, the little sort of intimacy but he was so great he was what was so great about robert was that he didn't try to like upstage you he was he was very quiet i mean those looks like that in that picture you just showed that sort of that look it, it, it's classic. I mean, it says so much, but he's not doing a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how it felt like for me working with him. When we were sort of talking face to face, I was just like, oh my God. Because <laughs> he was so, it was just, he was kind of really sexy, you know, and, and intense and just quiet. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely comes across for sure. As um, powerful as he was, the great thing about Regina is that she didn't like turn into a sap about it. She yes. said mm -hmm. she's still have been capable of having a one nighter with him and walking away. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Which I would say goes back to that whole army brat thing of like you never put down roots too deeply with anything. You just kind of mm -hmm. like kind of learn that you can't get too attached to anything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would say that sort of continues on that thread of how well that's constructed. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is in the writing as well, you know, it's yeah. in the script. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but thank you for that, because that, that it, it's, it's, it's challenging to kind of calibrate how far you should go in, in these mm -hmm. different directions. Sure. That, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You trust All of those to back if it's too much or tell you, like, wake up if it's not enough. You just have to trust that because you can't be watching mm -hmm. yourself. It's really an act of... Mm -hmm getting on the set <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a lot harder i think as as anyone who is not an actor and i'm certainly not but I, it's there's so much going on that you have to be aware of on a certain level that most people are just not and it, i think people may mistakenly very mistakenly think that oh well i could probably just wing it and do this or that and it's like no mm -hmm. No, that is a that is a gift to be able to convey certain things because you're having to do it all very subtly with little micro moves and eye flicks and and things like that, uh, and you can mm -hmm. easily go too far and it feels very very cheesy. So, um, mm -hmm. just really, it, it takes a, I think it takes a lot of work. I mean, you really yeah. need to know the script first of all. Mm -hmm. And then really understand your own character, understand where your character fits into the story. And then it you do you have to sort of break it down into little micro bits mm -hmm. as you go along. Um, and hopefully you have the guidance of a really good director um, to, mm -hmm. to steer you in the right direction because it's so, acting is so subjective um that you know it, it, it may it would have been a different movie obviously if if there were different actors in it but um 
but it might have been just as popular or more popular, or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's uh, no. It's hard. It takes a lot of dedication and a lot of work, don't you think, mm -hmm. Kelly? It's a lot of work to it's get in front of, of a camera. It's a lot, of, and, and and also you, you don't just come and be in your own little island. Whatever you think you prepared has to go out the window when you see what the other person is doing. That's true. It's you know. So it's like okay, you, you know. That's why um, you don't direct other actors because you had this little bit that you wanted to put in. You don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it can be like surprise. I'm doing this, and which is great because then it starts to read on your face. I don't know what's going on here. That's what people love to see is, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to figure something. They like to see that thought process of yeah. Now what do I? You know, and that's what it looks like. Yeah. It's real. And so well, yeah. Speaking of that, and speaking of the scene in the radio station, um, one of my favorite parts is in the radio station where uh, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly, kind of has a great interaction with uh, Robert, and so here, here it is, really quickly. <laughs> Open your eyes. <laughs> I just love that. I don't know if that was in the script or if you sort of added that. that that's so great. <laughs> I was so pissed that he's looking at us like we had a gun on us, you know. It's so it, it just annoyed the stuff out of yep. me. And so <laughs> happy. 12 year old yeah. me was looking at that going, that's exactly what I would have done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> there, there is another wonderful microaggression that you do um not aggression but expression <laughs> micro expression that you do in in that sequence it's it's where you find out that hector isn't a uh a dj oh. he's he's just a truck driver and there is just this <laughs> flash of disappointment on your face it's really yeah. small but so even in the apocalypse sam is disappointed this guy isn't a bigger thing than he actually is <laughs> yeah, <I do> love that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to talk about some some of the mall stuff. So, I mean, I know right here next to me is Chopping Mall. So, I have a question. I think that I know the answer, but I I don't want to presume to know. So, the mall that you guys shot in for the classic mall scene in Night of the Comet is that the same mall that you had that you were in in Chopping Mall or no? No, um, Chopping Mall is the Galleria. Okay. Last times was and my 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 mall trilogy um, <laughs> <laughs> was, 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 uh, in, in the gallery, but we were at a Bullock's downtown that was abandoned. And I oh. couldn't find that if my life depended on, it, I don't know where it was. <laughs> somebody had to tell me that. Cause you know, we're being dragged right. around. <laughs> show up here. Okay. Show up there. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I didn't know that. I thought it was in the Sherman Oaks Galleria, the Bullock's and the Sherman Oaks Galleria. No. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm able oh, well. to get away with that is I think it was an abandoned bullets. Oh, okay. And that that was chopping mall. <laughs> no, chopping mall was the no, that, that that was yeah. yeah. That yeah. was that was something. Yeah, we we had to wait for the stores to close, and then we get in there and tear the place apart, and then the crew would have to put it back together again so that they could open their store again at eight or nine. Wow. I don't know how they did that. You know, if you're going to be on a Roger Corman crew. <laughs> You could, you got to be able to do anything, you know. It's like go up there, get the moon, and bring it back. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. And then they do it, and they do it for like three bucks. So yeah, I don't know how they did it to this day. Well, that that brings up a wonderful question that I have, which is what what kind of directors do you both prefer to work with versus the type of directors that you don't like? What makes a great director from an actor's perspective? Um, is it is it something that what creative and production decisions have you learned to observe that alert you to a director that might be maybe even in over their heads or um, someone who just isn't giving you the guidance that you need to do what you're trying to do? Hmm. Not to well, not to name me, names, but just in general. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I like a, a director that's collaborative, you know, and, and does talk to me, you know, um, I like to hear back. Like if I do a performance, I want to know, mm -hmm. was that good? I don't he, I need him to come up and say, oh, that was so good. You know, have some sort of communication with him, some sort of a collaboration with him. 
Um, and I want him to absolutely feel free to, you know, tweak whatever I've done in any mm -hmm. way that he feels necessary because ultimately, the and theoretically, but this doesn't happen with every director, they're supposed to have the big vision. Although, however, having said that, it's sort of as an actor, like Kelly mentioned, you know, when you go into a scene with an actor that you, you've you never done a scene with before, you imagine how it's going to happen when you're practicing your lines or, you know, and when you get on the set, all of a sudden it's something completely different. So as an actor, you need to be open and flexible and re reactive to what's going on around you. And also as a director, you need to, um, be open to whatever the actors bring to a scene as well, um, mm -hmm. because it might be different from what you picture. But, mm -hmm. but, but absolutely, overall, the director has to have the big picture. He has to know what right. he wants the whole thing to look like and, mm -hmm. and guide you towards that. Um, but also being mm -hmm. open to maybe different choices than he had come up with or whatever. So I like I like communication with the director, but uh, having said that, there's there are many many directors who are more editors. You know, they'll just that they won't communicate with you at all. They'll just sit behind the thing and and in their minds they just think. I mean, all directors need to be editors in a certain way, but that's right. all they'll focus on is how they're going to cut the film together, um, as opposed to the performances and even the story itself. Uh, lots and lots of directors like that. So I prefer an artistic collaboration. I agree. For I agree. I've had, um, I remember on the soap one time, they didn't give us any feedback. And so like the first couple of times, um, this is on One Life to Live, they just were moving on. And I said, was that, a, you know, they didn't say anything. And Erica Slezak said, that's good. They they there was something wrong, mm -hmm. they would have told you. I'm like, eh, I want to <laughs> again, and again, I don't need to be told reassured that I'm good, but I do, I do like to hear, I, I like to hear when um, we talk about character and what needs to happen here for the story, what the scene, because there's no such thing as a scene that's just there for no reason. It's there right. to advance the story. So, mm -hmm. um, and I might, you know, I might not have the same, I might have not grasp the scene the same way the director wants it, because I'm thinking about, you know, the stuff that I need to do, but then I'm, you know, when I get that perspective and see what the other actor is doing and see where we show up, sometimes you don't know where you're going to be till you get there. Um, I, I like to collaborate, exactly, collaborate's a good word for it. I like to work together. Mm -hmm. I have a I have a few super chats I'd like to read really quickly. So your Muslim uncle says, still one of my favorite movies and favorite heroines. Thanks for coming and sharing with us. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I love my Muslim uncle. <laughs> <laughs> the Real Nightmare Nine says favorite mm -hmm. Catherine Mary Stewart movies are Night of the Comet, Dudes, and World Gone mm -hmm. Wild. So glad I caught this stream. Oh, yeah, Dudes, yeah. Dudes is something interesting, and uh, I, I'm interested to s sort of touch on that at some point because mm -hmm. um, I'd love to know what it was like to work with uh, Penelope Spheris as yeah. a director. Speaking of directors, um, you, I think you've worked with a couple of in the '80s. You worked with a couple of female directors, and uh, mm -hmm. do you do you notice a difference uh, working with a female director versus a male director and the types of things they like to to focus on in terms of story? Um, uh, well, Penelope Sparris is, is a very specific character for sure. And the movies that she does are very, very specific to her. Um, she's got an unusually bizarre creative vision of things. Um, and at the time I remember, um, it, it was unusual working with a female director. Um, although I didn't, I don't think I thought about it a lot, but it was like, it was un it was just different, I guess. But what was really interesting about Penelope is that now she has this long white hair, yeah. and she's 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 still just her face is still very white. But at the time, in the eighties, she was like um, always just dressed in black, and she had long <laughs> black hair, and she. I swear her skin was never exposed to the sun. And 
on the set, she had somebody carrying a, you know, an umbrella or a parasol around so she wouldn't get exposed to the sun. I mean, she had this real punk sort of thing going on. Yeah. Um, but she was a powerhouse man. She's little too. She's quite diminutive. And, but she was, you know, she knew what you, you could tell. She was just like in total control. Um, so that was great. And it, it was such a unique, um, just story and setup and movie. It was for me, you know, I always say, um, one thing I love about acting is I get to live vicariously through these characters. And that was another <laughs> one, you know, where I've always just loved horses I, as a kid. I just loved Westerns. And I thought, you know, um, galloping across a desert was just the coolest thing ever, and spinning guns and all that other stuff. And so when this character came along, I was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, it, that was, yeah, that was so, and I love the desert. I'm a, I'm a desert person and the horses, all that stuff was just like totally tapping into this fantasy life I had for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looked like a lot of fun riding across, mm. like on the horse. And I, I know you got, you got injured on that film, right? Like you. Um, right. Ironically, my big scene riding full out, and I really was. That was me riding. I, I can ride a horse, and right. I and I thought this is the greatest thing ever. And so it was a really long shot um, of me at one, you know, way away, and and I got into this full out gallop with this horse right towards the um, camera, and I was supposed to like, you know, just exit camera right as close as I could, you know, just right. so me way in the distance. And <laughs> well, as I was galloping towards the camera, um, the line producer pulls up in his little Jeep right where I'm supposed to exit. And I'm thinking, okay, am I going to stop this shot? Because it's a long shot. And still, again, we were on in film, you know, it's not like you can just erase a, did, uh, you know, a chip or whatever they do nowadays. Um, yeah. And so I just, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go past the camera and I'll just pull the horse off to the left or whatever and, and avoid the, the car. Well, movie horses, they don't really <laughs> listen to the actors. They're just like, oh, I do this. Okay. <laughs> and, it, you know, exited uh, camera right or whatever and um, stopped. I'm like pulling on, like, trying to get him to turn and stop. <laughs> it's like, urge. And I did not. I kept going. And I went oh. right into the oh. side of the Jeep. And I get up and I was like, oh, I'm fine. It didn't really hurt. And everybody's like, oh, oh my gosh. Quite, yeah. quite dramatic looking. It must have looked pretty dramatic. And they said, no, you've got to go get that. And I'm like, really bother me that much well I uh, so they made me go to urgent care or whatever <laughs> and as I was as I was changing into my civvies um in the um I mean civilian clothes but <laughs> civvies <laughs> sounds a little bit like civvies <laughs> <laughs> um I I I rested my um arm on this counter and my arm that was, as it turns out, broken, and it just exploded in pain. I'm like, oh, yeah. something's uh, up. And yeah, I broke my ulna, as it turns out. Oh, um, wow. So they gave me, and fortunately, we were towards the end of the shoot. There was like, I had like two or three days left to shoot. So I had a cast that was removable and a lot oh, of wow. painkillers. <laughs> and I finished oh. off the shoot, but I was really surprised. So that was my first right-sided injury. <laughs> we were talking about this before we got on, Kelly. I broke my finger. Well, you know, it turns out it's broken. My, remember when you were at the film yeah, festival? You, you were moving it, so I didn't think it was broken, but we were wrong. Yeah. Huh? <gasps> no. Uh, I finally went to have a doctor check it out, and yeah, broken right through. Oh, um, no. and, and you were standing so, there like it, it didn't hurt or anything? Well, I, I just thought I'd sprained it. I didn't know. Um, but it was probably a good idea to keep it like in a brace. Um, and then I've also, so my whole right side, my knee, 
my ulna and my pinky. I'm working my way up and be my <laughs> right jaw. So no, I'm don't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, it's my left side. Oh, Everything is that right? Yeah. <laughs> are you are you are you left-handed? I am right-handed. Oh, what? Well, there oh, you go. Right? There you go. <laughs> Well, Kelly, you were you were also directed by a female director, maybe more than once, but the one that's coming to my mind mm -hmm. is Amy Heckerling in uh, yep. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Um, what was your experience like working with her? Because that movie really tells a different, sort of a different view of like sort of teen relation movie mm -hmm. stuff than like, it's not the John Hughes view no, of, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. very different. So what, what was your takeaway on that? Well, it was a, she was very young. She was right out of, I was speaking of stoic, um, she was right out of NYU where she'd gotten a lot of attention for a, a short film that she did called Losing It. And it's about this girl who did not, even wanted to dispense with all um, fluffery, fluffery about getting losing her virginity and she just wanted to get on with it. <laughs> So, yeah. So I can see that reflected very clearly in Fast yeah. Times, yeah. But, you know, a lot of kids were like that. Mm, I mean, yep. it was actually written for the 70s. He did this in the 70s, but, you know, we did it in the 80s. So some things were different. Um, but I didn't realize, everybody would say, oh, a woman director. Now, when I got into the soaps, there were a lot of female executives. We had a woman director who, mm -hmm. um, you know, was probably, um, um, I, I didn't notice that she was like, a better director or more giving or more or anything you know i didn't i didn't i didn't really see this man director female director male director thing mm -hmm. happening until people mentioned it to me and i thought but i don't know about that because amy and the you know the soap and everything well i found out later on yeah now i see what you're talking about but uh, mm -hmm. and, i mean we were kind of ahead of our time in that way is we didn't realize there was going to be a problem i think <laughs> and then we found out there was a big problem <laughs> but i didn't know <laughs> Yeah, that's was, speaking of female directors, there's uh, rumors that there could be a remake of Night of the Comet by Roxanne mm -hmm. Benjamin. Certainly she has written a script, she said in 2019, mm -hmm. and she is hoping to direct it. Any thoughts on how a remake could work out? What your thoughts would be on that one? Well, I thought I, I knew that that was uh, something being talked about and she was very much involved with that. But from what I understand, it's kind of dead in the water. What do you, what do you oh. hear, Kelly? Um, I, I heard that it's kind of open season right now. So, yeah. Um, but doesn't, doesn't Tom have rights to the script? Yeah. So they, what, they would have to keep. Here's what happened. It's different is, because they screwed all these writers and directors in the 80s, they had to come mm. back. I mean, they were completely. Um, they came back with a couple of, with a couple of people who were low budget independent directors, and they gave them a certain percent of their film back. It's not a lot. What is it like? I don't know, five or ten, but enough to own it, enough to have ownership and be able to say what happens with it. And mm -hmm. it happened to uh, Jim Wynorski too um, from Chopping Mall. And so they have some say, and so you can't just go do whatever you want to do with their movies anymore, which I think is only fair. I so. think that's a, I think it's great because yeah. I, I, remakes always make me very nervous because there'll <laughs> never be anything like the original. And, and, you know, that's what makes these eighties movies so charming is they're the sort of the kind mm -hmm. of the innocence of the, the time. And, um, and the relatability, you know, the, mm -hmm. the people that, that love these movies, it's because they can relate to them on some level. These are like real girls. I mean, mm -hmm. I can imagine a remake would be some superhero girls going out <laughs> shooting zombies somewhere. And that's, yeah. not what it's a, that's not what it's about, you know? So yeah. I, I, yeah. Do, I, I do get nervous with the idea of remakes per se. First of all, I think that the remake thing is every but studios want them to do remakes because even if it's a disaster, they're going to get a certain amount of name value for selling it, so they're not going to lose as sure. much money, no matter if it sucks or not. Because people are, you know, then they're going to go tear it apart or whatever they're going to do. But somebody, they're going to know what it is. They, they're far mm -hmm. less inclined to do a movie because they like the script and there's a bunch of unknown people and a first time director. They don't do that anymore. So not I think at little. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, a lot of times people get, they sign on to do something and they say, you're gonna make a remake, you're gonna do a remake and they go, okay, because it's the only way that they can, you know, get a foot in the door and, and you know, and then I wish that they would just give them the right to do their own movie rather than yeah. just stick them with, oh, we're gonna call this a remake, but you know, then they try to inject their own stuff into it. And it, um, why don't just give these people a chance to do their own thing? I agree. I, I would love to yeah. see that more. And I mean, like you said, there's no way to really remake Night of the Comet. There are so many subtle parts of it that, you know, even something as big as, as Star Wars, you can't you can't really recapture the lightning in the bottle of any of these films mm -hmm. again. So you really just need to, you could set it in the same universe possibly um, and sort of do something, tell a new story that's set in that same universe. But I don't think that a remake of having new people play it and do the same things again is going to, it's not going to be the same movie. It may be good. It may not, but I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's such a time capsule of the eighties. Yeah. That's why people love it. And also um, I don't, I don't know that there was a, there was a certain thing about night of the comet, which was that we never turned on each other. And I think yeah. today the, the instinct is, Oh, and then they have a fight or, you know, competitiveness or what, and that feels truthful mm. to, to the writer at the time. But, I think what people love about us, we were together, you know, you were a team. Yeah. There's a, there's a yeah. scene that's yeah. probably my favorite scene in the movie, uh, which is the two of you um, sitting on the car. It's, it's this, it's around this time. Um, but right before this exact moment, actually, where you, you have the, the moving emotional scene, Kelly, where you're, mm -hmm. you're sort of, lamenting the fact that the boy you had a crush on and everyone you've ever known is dead. And I, I know that initially Tom Eberhardt wasn't going to even have that in the film. And then he sort of changed his mind and put it in there. I think that was an amazing choice. Um, do, do you feel like, what do you think about that scene? And, and do you think that your background and, and soap sort of helped you tap into that? Cause it's the perfect level of not too melodramatic, but not, you, you had you're definitely playing it very seriously so it really sells it i think i was so comfortable on with what i was doing of that of being on that set and working with all these people and i mean i really um was comfortable in the relationship and everything and i knew that there had to be a point with samantha where she, she's got you know she's got to have an arc she can't just deny everything the whole the whole movie because she's got she grows right um and I didn't do that, like, here I'm going to get serious. I didn't plan that per se, but what I did work on was just putting something personal and making it dust and having to say goodbye to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just made me cry. It's going to make me cry again. So. I know. It's it's very moving. It's very touching. And and that's, that's sort of what we're talking about is that it's not just about these two kick-ass teen girls who don't care about anything and they're just you know going shopping and shooting zombies that's not what this movie's about that scene along with a lot of other scenes is what this movie is about so uh it's hard yeah. to just recapture that well also you, there has to, we have to stop every once in a while and and, and go okay we're this is the situation because we do goof around a lot through the rest of it you know <laughs> yeah we have that mall scene you got to set that up the mall scene has got to be like totally drastically different from what you just saw so and it is yeah yeah it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Definitely. One of the one saying. of the things I like about that is that it's motivated. You know, it, clearly Reggie takes Sam sh on a shopping spree to take her mind off it, mm -hmm. and yeah. it, so it comes from it. a real place. Yeah, the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also because it, so you could see a version of this movie, Valley Girls, at the end of the world that looked down on the two characters yeah. that was making fun of them, but you're not, you're that. along for the ride. That was a lot of that yeah. going on at the time, yeah. 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 But you're you're totally with those characters during that mall scene. The the mall scene actually that I think we have another clip that's um Catherine in the in the mall scene. She manages to achieve a very a very clever disguise during the mall scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which one this is, Conrad. Yeah, What's it called? Yeah. What's it named? Um, is, Ka is it Catherine as a mannequin? I oh, think. there we go. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I love that. I totally thought you were a mannequin. <laughs> yep.
Me too. I love that outfit. I remember yeah, that outfit. Thinking, yeah. This is hot. It was so 80s, you know, sparkly <laughs> shoulders. Oh, yeah. That was, I, that was really fun. I loved your shirt at the beginning of the movie where you're, you know, the main shots at the beginning. It is, I, don't, I can't tell from the color timing and the film print if it is sort of an aqua color or a blue, but it, the cut of it is just like Perfect. a flame green, 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 wasn't it? Yeah, it was sort of aqua. It was it was a, a kind of a blue green, sort of a light blue green kind of a color. Um, yeah, I love that thing too. I love the wardrobe. You know, the, with the wardrobe, um, uh, the wardrobe person took me out to shop. So the things okay. that I wore were my choices. You know, oh, I, yeah. I, and I loved it. I, I kept a lot of the stuff afterwards too. I mean, that shirt got pretty dirty, I think. I don't think they had a lot of changes. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but also I had those little boots that yes. kind of, those leather, they pulled oh, it love over. Those. So much. I loved those. I kept those for years. I, there's a lot of the wardrobe I kept because I just loved it. I love the wardrobe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I got to choose none of what I wore because <laughs> 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 the, the production design was so good. It was it was John Mudo, and he went on to do like some big stuff. But his his thing was everything is drab because life is gone, except for Samantha's like. <sighs> so it's yeah, all yeah, yeah. And right. so that was that was what they went for. I didn't get a say in that. I didn't know what they were doing, and all I knew was why am I dressed like a clown all the time? <laughs> she looks great. <laughs> She was oh. awesome. Her clothes are so cool. And I got red and yellow on. And then, you know, I mean. Yeah, you did. But you sold it, man. But it was perfect for the mm -hmm. character. It was perfect. I it's like that. Good. It's like the cheerleading outfit. I mean, the blue and green, or no, green and pink, or whatever it was. Aqua. Yeah, and, and turquoise. And bright pink. Oh, turquoise and, and pink. I mean, it was it was perfect. It was who you were. I, my favorite <laughs> It cracked me up was the one at the very, very end. You know, you look like oh you're ready gosh. to be at the beach or downtown. Yeah, but LA like as a much old, like a middle-aged woman, not as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, Catherine's, uh, Catherine's outfit is so conservative. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh. Again, I got I got to choose that because, and, and the reason I chose that, people would say, why did you have that really ugly dress on? I said, I am now Mother Earth. I've got to look the role. I've got to look like the matronly person mm -hmm. who is now, I am mm -hmm. the matron of the world. Mm -hmm. or, so um, I, I absolutely went for it with the whole <laughs> super conservative, not my taste at all. That I did not keep. <laughs> well, the, more, the more she did it, the more irritated I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it think works. You're <laughs> <laughs> We're talking ghosts. <laughs> well, it's like this. It's like this outfit. It's so <laughs> what? right. That's what I'm saying. I'm I love like, it. Though. Wow. I love it. <laughs> this is this is what Sam would choose at the mall. I mean, that's, that's what right. she would go for. It's mm -hmm. it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and then she would say which one because she's always trying to get her sister to pay attention to her. So yeah, sure. right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this one will stay in style longer for sure, because yeah. <laughs> that's important now. <laughs> that's that's uh, very important. Very important. You get to set the style now, so it's whatever you say it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, talking about um, costumes, uh, what, what's the story with the scientists at the end? Because they they all have these very fashionable white belts. <laughs> <laughs> we did. They really did. I don't know if I have the belts, but I mean, here's Mary Warnoff with her lab coat and her. Yeah, they were they were one piece things. You know, they, they were. I don't know. Jumpers. Yeah, they all were dressed the same mm -hmm. in a very monochromatic sort of style. I don't. That mm -hmm. was obviously a production choice except mary um, Wynn had leg warmers on she that's did correct that's correct she stood out with the leg warmers that's hilarious she's hilarious you know she's again very sort of quiet and subtle but she was so in touch with that character and she just you know she had those little again sort of microscopic things that she would do just to make her character stand out mm -hmm. i have very a little good. clip of mary what do you expect me to do, Oscar? Go for my gun? Of course. 
course not. <laughs> that's she's so excellent. Excellent. He, that, you know that's his sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah and she just like nailed it yeah definitely yeah. but yeah, i love yeah. seeing her we i i just re-watched chopping mall uh not too long ago and uh i love her scenes at the beginning of that are just so, so gratuitous and just like why is she there but it's just absolutely she's in character is it from eating raul um and she's mm. sort of sitting there and just <laughs> it's hilarious to see especially right after having seen night of the comet recently she's um oh you mean in chopping and chopping mall yeah at the beginning oh, yeah. where she's sitting like sort of looking at the demo of the new robots and uh, yeah, look, yeah they were rep reprising the blands from yeah. eating roll and the joke was supposed to be they had a that they had a restaurant in the mall right, right. <laughs> and so there was a scene where they wanted to, to show them bringing in a horse oh, no. and <laughs> Roger's like, I'm not buying you a horse. And then none of this is happening. They're not going to get a horse poop all over the mall. No, 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 no. So, so they ended up just kind of like appearing there and, and, you know, being their characters. But it's always cool to see them show up in here. Yes. So I do have a few super chats I'm going to read. Um, Connor says, Catherine, I just wanted to say I love your son's name. <laughs> and he spells it that way, too, by the way. Same spelling, which is a little bit unusual. So thank you, Connor. You've got a beautiful name yourself. <laughs> Zygma Experiment says, if there are two movies I'd never want to see remade, it's Night of the Comet and The Last Starfighter. Brilliant films. 80 sci-fi mm -hmm. movies rule. Yes. Um, agreed. Yeah, I, agreed. Agreed. I think um, definitely the, uh, the special effects from The Last Starfighter, even though they are early it's part of the the charm because back at the day you, we saw those and we were like, Oh my God, that, how did they do mm, that? Mm, yeah. Well, they were really the, the genesis of CGI, those special effects. They were creating the programs while we were shooting the movie to, yeah. to make that. And the, the, the technical guys were, they wanted to have more time. They ran out of time. They wanted to get more detail into what they were doing, but they ran out of time. So, but, it's it, they were literally the gen genesis of, of CGI. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything from there, you know. Of course, it's it's a little more sophisticated now, just a little. I mean, you know, back then the <laughs> the computers that they had to write all these programs were like the size of this room, you know. And now we, and they had less memory than you have in your iPhone. So, right. um, yeah, <laughs> things have changed. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah. Tree, Tree Theodore says, what is the most valuable constructive criticism or praise you've received? Nice work, everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, my. Mm, that's a good one. That's a really good one. <sighs> I remember <laughs> I did this. On this I did, movie I did or this anything? I would assume on anything, but... <laughs> I remember I did this uh, mini series called Hollywood Wives. This is this is a uh, um, a bit of advice I got from Stephanie Powers. I was I was new. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Well, I guess it was uh, after Night of the Comet, so I knew a little bit. But I was in, in this glamorous mini series called Hollywood Wives, and I was doing this scene with Stephanie Powers. I'm like, oh my god, it's Stephanie oh Powers! <laughs> and and so I was talking to her. I was supposed to play this young naive thing. And um, I was like talking away to her like this. He goes, Catherine, look me in the eyes when you talk to me. <laughs> I'm going, okay. <laughs> that was my little piece of advice. But I also got, it, also, I won't name the actor, but I've done, uh, I did this uh, TV movie with an actor who, like, uh, going back to what Kelly said about actors should never direct other actors. I was doing, I was sort of playing this kind of alcoholic person. Um, and the actor I was working with, he goes, is that how you're going to do it? I was just like, um, I, I went, um, yes. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it was just, it was so horrible. I was like, why would you try to like, ab you know, wreck it for it? It, it, just, oh, no. it was just a horrible thing to do. That's so awful. those are just sort of. Stephanie Powers and uh, yeah, isn't that awful? It was just like it's I don't like that person. <laughs> it's terrible. It's nothing, nothing to do with the work. It's more like uh, something 
it says more about him than it does about anything else. Yes. Right. I mean, if, if it was that bad, in his opinion, it may be perhaps the director should say something to me, not you. Right. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, yeah. I, I I look back at it and I think yeah. my choice was perfectly fine. He was just being an A-H. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. Look what about it. you, Kelly? Have you gotten any amazingly oh. helpful or harmful cr critiques? Mm -hmm. Well, one my favorite direction I got on the soap opera was from the female director. And she came, she's giving us notes really quick. And she goes, oh, and right there, boo-hoo, right? I think you to cry at that moment, which I. I'm stealing. <laughs> yeah. Which I. <laughs> uh, so that was that is not as helpful as I would have liked, but um, <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> yeah. And so, oh my god! I, yeah, I learned from I learned from the woman who played my mother. They don't have time to direct the actors. I mean, sometimes, it, boy, but it's it's really a luxury for them too if they ever get a chance to talk to. So it's more about the actors getting together and and helping each other. I, I'm so sorry. There's something that's okay. Back, backing <laughs> up apparently. <laughs> um, but, um, I think that I tend to, as, as an, I will tend to not trust that something's coming off like we wanted it to. And so one time um, an acting teacher I had, Roy London, who was fabulous, um, mm. said, Kelly, Kelly, you playing sexy is like me playing bald. Trust it. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I realized that, you know, yeah, I mean, just th know that you're some of that stuff. You don't have to go, here I am being sexy now. You're right. Mm. <laughs> and you're a kid, you know, you do everything wrong. You just do. It's a, it's funny. It's funny. It's a, it's a mysterious um, uh, occupation and, and sort of navigating you, your way through sort of the mystery of what works and what doesn't work and mm -hmm. all all the stuff that you hear about it all the different kinds of training you can get ultimately it's about confidence and and knowing mm -hmm. yourself and and being able to you know use what it is that you have with with confidence mm -hmm. and specificity really um mm -hmm. and that's what because uh, being on camera they see every the audience sees everything they see mm -hmm. everything that's going on behind your eyes, um, especially in close-ups, <laughs> um, as opposed to like the stage where you, you know, it's much bigger and you, you know, talk to the back of the house and all that other stuff. Um, you have to trust your instincts and trust your, uh, the work that you put into it. For yeah. sure. It takes, right. it takes a long time to learn that. It takes a long, like, I feel like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at my age, which is old, <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like I'm really finally getting that, you know, know and it feels <laughs> really incredible. I know. I know. A it's, lot of trial and error. There's, there's some <laughs> maturity that has to come before you realize that the, the way to do this is to get this, to stop thinking about yourself, what you need to get, what you're afraid of, what, get your head out of yourself. Know that you're there to make this scene happen with all these other people that need right. this to happen that are going to lose jobs, you're going to lose homes, they're going to lose wives if this doesn't go, <laughs> go over. No pressure. The other actors, <laughs> you know, don't space on the other act. I mean, yeah. so if you, if you come from a place of what am I, what, what's my, what's my job here? What, 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 what can I do for other people? Then you're not thinking about yourself and you're always better. Right. But it takes a long time to learn that. I mean, you just kids yeah. don't know. Yeah. The things that we didn't know when we were in our 20s could fill volumes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Conrad, Dan, any, any closing questions since we are almost at time? Oh. I'm sure Dan must have some burning questions. I don't know whether I do. Ooh. I feel like I've all been I mean, I, the tiny question, uh, Probably the most terrifying scenes in in Night of the Comet were, were was that dream sequence with the the cop zombie, um, just <laughs> tremendous uh, makeup effects on on the zombies. I mean, mm -hmm. how was that to to act mm -hmm. in those scenes? It was cold and sticky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
wouldn't really break. And so I had it, and you can, now that I've told you this, you can see me do it in a closet, you know, <laughs> I had to stick my finger in it and puncture it in order to get it to squirt out. Yeah. And it was, oh. and then, but I only had one oh. dress and it was ruined. Oh. That dress. It was oh, absolutely wow. carry time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool dress though. <laughs> it was a, it was a great dress. Um, yeah, but th that stuff, it, it's cold and it's sticky and you can't wash it off. It's very hard to get off once you're done too. It sticks. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah mostly, that's... mostly it's a, most of these things come down to, like you know, it's, oh, is it scary to work with that monster? Well, only because you might knock it down. Only because I had to break the blood bag myself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, I would like to thank uh, Catherine and Kelly so much for taking the time to speak with us today at Iconicon about this amazing film, which is definitely one of my favorite movies. And uh, Conrad and Dan also, thank you for joining us. And yes. um, good to see you. Yeah. It's so yeah, you. it's so good to see you guys again, Australia and England. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Gotta love it. And international. I love Melbourne. I want to go back. Oh yeah. Yeah, I want. I want to go, I want to go <laughs> as well. Yeah. There, so. I, I know they I'll have a kitchen, right, Dan? Oh yeah, Sorry. right. They're smart there. I'll. I'll have. A, you can make me a cup of coffee in your kitchen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if if you want to talk about the last Starfighter, um, we will. Catherine will be joining us again on Sunday at four p.m. Eastern time, to, uh, along with Lance Guest, to talk about yeah. the last Starfighter. So um, please join us for that as well uh it should be a lot of fun uh, just as this, this is my iconicon so. weekend it Yay. is <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate it we're so excited to have you yeah, here so, so thanks everyone for joining us and we will catch you guys on the next stream thank you for having thank us you. and thanks yeah, for loving thank you so me. much thank love you, you kelly <laughs> hey, see you later yeah see you soon <laughs> <laughs>